He's worthy to be praised always. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you've been through, the sun is not always shining in our life, is it? Sometimes we walk in the dark, and when we walk in the dark, we can have hope. And when we walk in the dark, there is light available if we will move to it. Tonight, we have a night of worship tonight. We do these about uh, once a quarter. It's going to be a powerful time. It's going to be one unlike one we've ever done before. Zeke's got some different ideas he's going to go for tonight. I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to happen as he does that. We're in the series called Closer, as if God were to have, back me up, as if God were to have a word for the year, his word wouldn't be closer. So if we will draw near to God, his word is very plain and clear. He'll draw near to us. He will draw near to us. And I don't know what lack you have in your life this year, today, or this decade. Whatever lack you have can probably be resolved if you get closer, closer to the source, closer to the one who can meet every need that you have. Because that's what's at stake if we don't get closer. As we end the service this morning, as we end the message, we'll have a time of communion as we uh, see things set up here this morning. And then I will also invite you back to the altar again today. Because we can be as close to God as we want to be. We are. We are as close to God as we want to be because there's nothing keeping us from getting closer. And we want to make sure you have an opportunity to get closer. One time Jesus was asked a question, what's the most important thing? And he said, it's loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And when we love him thoughtfully, it means we give him our attention. When we love him practically, it means we give him our abilities. This series is focusing on loving God passionately. And that means we're giving him our adoration. And we're giving him our adoration. So how do, we know how to worship when things are going great. How do you worship when you feel like you're walking in the dark? Because sometimes we are. Life wounds us. Crises, catastrophes, conflicts in our lives, from mistakes, from sins, from abuse, abuser, neglect, accidents, natural death, self-inflicted wounds, health situations, mistakes of your children, mistakes of your parents, mistakes you made as a parent. I mean, anyone can worship when things are good, right? I mean, singing when life is easy is not hard. Honoring God and loving him and breaking down and opening yourself up to him and worshiping him when things are tough and you're in the middle of suffering instead of winning a lottery, that's challenging. Sometimes we're in the dark. Sometimes we don't see. We don't see because we're distracted. Squirrel, 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 squirrel. We don't see because we're distracted. It's easy to get distracted, right? We've all been there. Sometimes it's not that we don't see. Sometimes we can't see because everything is just piling up and we're drowning in what we call our life. And sometimes it's not that we don't see or we can't see. Sometimes it's because we won't see and we don't want to see because we're blind and too self-focused. If that's where you might be, imagine light coming back into your life. Imagine freedom coming back because you can find light even in the darkest seasons of your life. I want to take you to a scripture in Acts chapter 16 where some people that were in some literal darkness and what happened when they chose to worship. Acts chapter 16. This is Paul and Silas in the book of Acts written by Luke. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, quote, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved, end quote. Nothing wrong with that. It's actually totally accurate. But she kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled, he turned around and said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. Just because the words are right doesn't mean someone's, someone's uh, filled with God. At that moment, the Spirit left her. Now, this is an amazing thing by Paul. This is him using a, whole, a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's called discerning of spirits and realizing just because they're saying the right thing didn't mean their heart was right and the Spirit was right on this. And so, so you've you got discernment happening here and then deliverance happens. So Paul, Paul and Silas are in the light. They're walking in Christ and they're going to the place of prayer because they're going to go ahead and experience some more light. But on the way there, they see some darkness. And so they take a side trip and get rid of that darkness because light always conquers darkness. If you're walking in the dark, this is not rocket science. Move to the light. Move to the light. But if you stay sitting in the dark, you will stay in the dark. You'd like to think that people would be excited that this girl got set free, but that was the opposite of what happened. They are victims of some unjust judging. Verse 19. When the owners of the slave girl realized their hope of making money was gone, 
you're going to see a lot of parallels here between first century here and, and uh, uh, 2019 America. There's a lot of money to be made in using people. There's a lot of money to be made in uh, doing things that aren't right. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. Let's bring it before everybody. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews. Let's cast them as something. And they're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans. Hey, we're a little bit better than them. To accept or practice. And Paul and Silas are accused by a crowd that's totally unclued in in terms of what's happening. And they're being sentenced by the socially powerful. Let me say that again. They're being sentenced by the socially powerful. Do you remember what that was like in junior high? Being sentenced by the socially powerful because you didn't fit in. Remember what that was like in high school? Now let's not just stop there. What about your current office culture? What about the family pecking order when you gathered for the holidays? What about the community power brokers? It's mob rule. It's political correctness in the first century. Vengeful, targeted, selfish, and immoral. And it's not right. It's not fair. I want justice, but they don't get justice. Instead, they get jailed. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. They can't win for nothing. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, as if flogged wasn't enough. You needed a, is that an adjective or an adverb? Somebody help me. What is severely? Adjective. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Grammar Nazis everywhere. It's always good to have them. The, uh, except when you're on Facebook and you make a mistake. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten after they'd been severely, an adjective, flogged. They were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Also an adjective, right? Carefully? Yeah, yeah. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell, because just the regular cell wasn't good enough, and fastened their feet in stocks. Paul and Silas endure a painful punishment while powerless. Can you imagine? If you're walking in the dark, you probably can. And it's embarrassing. It's unlikely they were stripped back in the jail. They were probably stripped publicly and then beaten. Why? In setting people free, they were placed in prison. Do you see the dichotomy there, the irony? In setting people free, they got placed in prison. And maybe your darkness that you're battling is something actually you did that was a good thing that backfired. Now your situation of your darkness you might be in or your prison you might be in is probably not a literal prison and you probably weren't literally stripped and you probably weren't literally beaten and I hope you weren't literally flogged and especially not literally severely flogged. But what your ex did makes you feel like you were stripped and what your boss did makes you feel like you were beaten and what your parent or child has done made you wish you had been flogged instead. Maybe it's your health. Your finances are in a catastrophe, your career's in conflict, your hope's in crisis. Let's we'll pause here for a moment. And you may have simply just been trying to do your best, and it got misjudged, misinterpreted, and now the crowd's all in an uproar, even if that crowd is just the other members of your household or just two people in your life. Now you're judged, you're imprisoned, meaning got boundaries on you, and feeling punished, and you haven't even been allowed to be heard yet. How do you feel? What goes through your mind? What goes through your heart? What words are you saying that aren't even leaving your mouth, but you're saying them in your heart like crazy? Because maybe the prison and the darkness that you're battling right now, even if you're not guilty, is causing you to come up with bitterness and bargaining in your life. You fight bitterness and you start bargaining with God. Or revenge and rage starts wanting to well up inside you towards others. And you know it's not what you want to give into. So eventually, then the, the anger and the apathy wants to come up, and you're just like, fine, I'll just give up. And we have to be careful there. If we're not careful, we'll give up following the gospel of grace, and we'll start adapting to something that's called the karma of personal performance, and we'll base how we should feel based on how good of a job that we do. And then you ask the regular question, right? What did I do to deserve this? What did I do to deserve this crisis in my life? What did I do to deserve this catastrophe? What did I do to deserve this conflict? Perhaps nothing. Perhaps everything. But can I tell you, if you could find out what you did to deserve this, and if you could find out how to fix it, it would still have you in that prison. It's actually going to be irrelevant if you find out what you did to deserve this, because chances are you didn't do anything to deserve it. 
The question isn't going to be, what, 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 what did I do to get into this? The question is going to be, what are you going to do now that you're in the dark? When you don't see. When you can't see. When you won't see. What will you do now? Paul and Silas chose to worship. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. After being stripped and beaten and severely flogged and put into the inner cell and having the stocks placed on their feet, they were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. They chose to pray and sing. They chose to worship. Do you think they felt like worshiping? Hey, Paul, how you doing? Oh, man, I can't lift my feet. Silas, how about you? Well, I got all this blood all over me, man. Hey, how about we pray and sing? It's kind of ridiculous, isn't it? Sure, let's turn to hymn number 465. Let's go. You start. Here we go. Victory. In Were they being hypocritical? Did they get knocked in the head a few times too many? Is that why they started praying and singing around midnight? Did they have too much caffeine before they went to bed and they were still awake at midnight and didn't know what to do? Or did they simply choose? In spite of our circumstances, in spite of this darkness, we're not just in a cell, we're in the inner cell. They are in literal darkness. In spite of all that, we're going to move toward the light. In spite of the fact that we can't even move, <laughs> we're going to move toward the light. And Paul and Silas had all the emotional options available to them that you and I have. Bitterness and bargaining. Oh, yeah, they had it available to them. They had every right to be bitter. And to go ahead and try and start bargaining with God. Rage and revenge. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Paul's definitely dealing with it a little bit because he just got called a, a Jew with the doing stuff that Romans don't approve of, and they forget that Paul's got a Roman citizenship. Oh, Paul's even got the card he can play. Anger and apathy? Well, fine! Next time I see someone possessed by a demon, I'll just leave her be! Would anybody blame him? You wouldn't. I wouldn't. That's not what he does. They did not let their literal prison and their literal darkness that they were in cause an internal prison and an internal darkness. And you may not have control over the darkness that's around you because of the situation or the circumstances where you find yourself, but you have control. You have total control whether you will move to the light or whether you will just sit in the darkness. So if you're following along online and you're going, where's all the fill in the blanks? There's only one, and this is it. And the way out is not to look in, but lift up. You want out, don't look in. You'll be distressed and not at rest. Lift up. What did I do to deserve this? What do I do to fix this? Is looking in. You need light? Lift up. The scripture says the foundations of the prison were shaken. The foundations of our prisons that we are in are going to be totally tied to our soul and our soul's response to what God has allowed in our life, even though we don't like what he has allowed. Bitterness and bargaining, that foundation can be shaken. Revenge and rage, anger and apathy, that can foundation can be shaken if we'll move toward the light. And when you're in the dark, get some light. And light's available. Light is available. Simple response would probably be, though, but I don't feel like worshiping, man. I don't want to be a hypocrite. Well, it's pretty noble not to be a hypocrite, but can you imagine trying that on someone you love? Hey, I don't feel like loving you right now. I'm sorry, man. I don't want to be hypocritical. I, I didn't feel like loving you. No, loving someone you don't feel like it is not hypocritical. It's sacrificial. And when you're in the dark, one of the last things you probably want to do is sacrifice for somebody else because you think that's how you got there. It's time for someone to sacrifice for me. And you're probably right. It probably is time for someone to sacrifice for you. And he already has. And he sacrificed everything. And he's the one calling you to the light. He's the one that says, draw near to me. And I'll draw near to you. Isaiah wrote a pretty interesting verse. Who among you fears the Lord? That's probably you. 
You probably fear God. You respect him. And who uh, uh, obeys the word of a servant? That's you. You're trying. I'm trying to follow God. Yeah. Let him who walks in the dark and has no light. Is that you as well? Might be. What should that person do? Trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Which means worship regardless of circumstances. Worshiping regardless of circumstances. Worship is independent of circumstance. Is independent of location, independent of fairness or reason or logic or justice. I want justice. I bet you do. So do I. So does God. Now, while Paul and Silas are praying and singing hymns to God around midnight, the other prisoners, what are they doing? They're listening and they're watching. The other people in your life that are imprisoned by their own crisis, by their own catastrophe, by their own calamities, by their own conflict, and their own crimes are going to watch, especially if you're a follower of Christ, are going to watch how you worship in the dark. Worship's never for an audience, but it always has one. Worship's not for an audience, but it always has one, especially if you're in the dark. You will set others free when you worship in the dark. You will set other people free when you worship in the dark. The scripture says that everybody's chains came loose. They did. But where are they? They're still in prison. Their chains are loose, but they're still in prison. Your circumstances and your situation that cause you to be in the dark may never change. Some of them cannot change. Because one of the reasons you feel in the dark is because you attended somebody's funeral and now they're no longer here. And you have things you wish you would have said. Those circumstances cannot change. But you can change when you move toward the light. And you won't be the same again. Even if some of those circumstances are impossible to change. An older song says that the chains that seem to bind you, they serve only to remind you that they can drop powerless behind you when you praise him when you worship and that means giving yourself totally in worship not reservedly not holding back it'd be easy to say god you give me light you bring light to my life i'll worship you you get me out of this i'll worship you now we've gone from bitterness to bargaining you know what the next step is god i'm not going to worship you until you get me out of this blackmail And God's challenging you, now before I give you light, worship me. Yeah. I'm not talking easy stuff. I know that today. I know that. And the reason we can communicate clearly about this is what Jesus went through and what Jesus did and the sacrifice he made. Zeke, you want to get your team ready? You realize what this is, right? How many of you ever watched the TV show Prison Break? Hands? This is a real-life prison break. In this TV show, this innocent guy gets put in jail. And so the character, Michael Schofield, says, hey, I'm going to go ahead and and I'm going to go into that jail, gets arrested on purpose, so he can get his brother out of jail to go rescue him. And so Michael Schofield gets arrested, goes into jail, and his brother's going, what are you doing here? I'm here to rescue you, man. He goes, how are we going to get out of here? And he takes his shirt off, and he's got the, 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 the plans for the building, the blueprints tattooed all over his body. That's how we're going to get out of here. Jesus came and entered our humanity, our prison, our darkness, fully understanding what it's like to be misunderstood, hurt, stripped, beaten, severely flogged. And when light came into the world, the darkness could not overcome it. And then Jesus comes in, and he's willing to rescue us out of this, and he's got the, the, the escape plan tattooed on his hands, and tattooed on his feet, and there's one hole in his side as well. But the question is, are you willing to leave the prison and go where he's leading? We easily ask, give me light first. But he's not offering you light first. He's offering you himself. He's saying, you move to him, you'll find light. If you will move to him, you'll find light. From bitterness to bargaining to blackmail will wipe away the gospel of grace in your life and take you right into the karma of personal performance and 
personal performance, none of us stack up. That's why. We have what we call communion. Communion. 